not will be with me the next time we meet. We, uh, we meet. We brought our texts for. I brought some texts from Great. Them. I don't. Uh, what's what, what the what they have in common? Among the things they have a lot in common. Among the things they have in common is that they were both very very influential in the 20th century, but essentially forgotten today. It's a shame because they have a lot of important things to say. Um, so let's see if we can resurrect them a little bit tonight. And they're both talking about uh, American government in the context of World War II and its aftermath. Um, when the world was under uh, the potential dominance of, of evil. So let's start with Niebuhr first. This, he wrote a lot of books. So this is probably this, the one that most people remember, The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness. Do you remember when we covered that? You remember that? He, he identifies two groups of people who hold two very different views of human nature. And he says both of these views are very detrimental to the preservation of the democratic government. One group he terms, he terms the children of light. They believe uh, that human beings are fundamentally uh, moral and rational. And he calls them moral sentimentalists. Isn't that a good name? Moral sentimentalists. Because they're unable to appreciate the role of selfishness in the decision making either of others or of themselves. themselves yeah. For this reason, Niebuhr concludes that the children of light are foolish. Here on page 11, this is what he says. He says, um, modern democratic civilization is in short sentimental rather than cynical. It has an easy solution for the problems of anarchy and chaos on both the national and international level of community because of its fatuous and superficial view of human beings. It does not know that the same man who is ostensibly devoted to the common good may have desires and ambitions, hopes and fears, which set him at variance with his neighbor. It may, must be understood that the children of light are foolish, not merely because they underestimate the power of self-interest among the children of darkness, but because they underestimate this power among themselves. The other group is, of course, the children of darkness. They believe that human beings are immoral and irrational, and Niebuhr calls them moral cynics. They deny the roles of such values as love and justice, honor and decency in human lives. So because they appreciate the influence of human selfishness, Niebuhr concludes that they're not foolish at all, but they're evil because they actually take great pleasure and relish in selfishness. They glorify it, really, and seek to exploit the ignorance and selfishness of others for their own glory, their own purposes. Can you give me an example of, uh, of a child of light in world history or American history? <coughs> Think about that for a second. Woodrow Wilson. Martin Luther King. Why, why would you choose Martin Luther King? That he didn't recognize evil in others? Maybe he underestimated it a little. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. But I just remember from uh, your courses that there were very few children of light. Maybe. According to Niebuhr, they outnumbered the, ch the children of darkness. And they're predominant in, in American history. Okay. King, I, I think, well, I mean, but that's a good guess. I think King wouldn't fit into that category. He knew he was going to get beat up, and he knew that his followers were going to be beat up, but he felt it was necessary to sacrifice themselves. Okay, that. so he's not a child. I don't think so. So people like Rosa Parks and um, Martin They knew Luther exactly King. what they were getting into. They knew, they knew the violence that they were getting into. Okay, so we're looking for an optimist then. Somebody we're looking for somebody who, remember, denies evil in others. Well, let's go with a world leader first. 
He comes out of a plane waving a treaty with a big smile on his face, and he claims that this treaty will obviate the need for World War II. Remember, Neville, Cham right, right, remember right, 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 Neville Chamberlain? Okay. Right. In 1938, he, Hitler is ravishing Europe even then. He's taken over Austria, and he's on his way to take over Czechoslovakia. So uh, the Prime Minister of England, Neville Chamberlain, travels to Munich and sits down with Hitler and says, we'll give you Czechoslovakia and Austria if you promise that you won't take over any other country. And they signed the treaty. So he comes to England waving the tre Treaty of Munich. And he says, uh, you can thank me because we won't have to fight World War II. Hmm. So that's what we call a child of light. So give me an example of, uh, that gives it away, give me an example of a child of darkness in world history. He signs a treaty with Hitler fully believing that Hitler will uh, honor it. <coughs> he signs a treaty with Hitler fully believing that Hitler will honor it. So, so Hitler, of course, is the most famous example of a child of darkness. He had no intention of honoring it. As a matter of fact, he made fun of the whole notion of honor itself. Mm. But how about in American history? Child of darkness? Who, who either no. one, a child of light or a child of darkness. I think Wilson for light. That's a good, that's a good, that's a very, very good answer. The one I'm thinking about, most of all, would be Herbert Hoover. Why would it be Herbert Hoover? Who's that? He was the president during, during the uh, beginning of the Great Depression in 1929. He came before Franklin Roosevelt. Well, he so didn't want... Child of light or a child he, he's, of a, he's, a, he's an infamous child of light because he didn't think that the government had to pass any radical laws to uh, keep people's jobs and make sure that they kept their homes and feed their family. He believed that the, that the economy, as all radical laissez-faire, would, would balance itself out somehow. Now give me a famous example of a child of darkness. These are all the questions, but I, I'm asking them because uh, I want to make sure that you understand Niebuhr's concepts. Nixon. Nixon is Nixon is a very good, very 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 good choice. I'm thinking, of course, of Donald Trump. And the reason is, is what is, do you think, in his heart of hearts, is the main purpose he wanted to be president? To, to check it off the, uh, the bucket list. That's a good answer. I think it's to improve his brand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember, he never divested his holdings. Right. And we still don't know anything about his uh, tax returns. If that guy Mueller can get those tax returns, Trump will not be in office very long. Because what 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 is the suspicion? What is the suspicion they'll tell us? That the uh, the Rosneft he got like some huge uh, chunk of Rosneft. That he oil. owes. That he owes billions of dollars to these Russian oligarchs who are controlled by Putin. Because it's just very odd that he hates the mayor of uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, but he's in love with Putin. So as soon as they find out, this stuff that's going on with Russia influencing the election is really bizarre. Have you been, have you been following this? Yeah. Facebook stuff? The Facebook stuff, but also hiring American pollsters to find out what places, what cities, and what regions, and what states were more likely to fall for this fake news that they planted. They picked uh, what, Michigan or Wisconsin or something? And Texas, sure. And Alabama. Yeah. You didn't need to. Well, he, that's right. So, <laughs> you didn't need help in Alabama. But, but if this mother does a good job, he'll find out not only who started the program and traced it back to Putin, but he'll also find out the Americans. Yeah, they had to rely on Americans to give them that information and right. tell them what kind of news, what kind of fake news hmm. would be most effective in getting votes for Trump. Putin is president of Russia. Um, 
Ask any question you want. I love your questions. He was asking who Putin was. Yeah. I have a question about Niebuhr. Wasn't he a theologian? He was the most famous theologian in America in the 20th century, the most influential. What's 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 he noted? What's it like his notable theology? Is there like a notable theological work? That's what I'm. That's what I'm. Is children th of light? This children? is the that, theological, that's the theological work. work. What it's theological because he's going to reject both of these popular views, optimism, cynicism, and come up with a third way. And where do you suppose the third way will come from? Bible? I mean, Christianity, Christianity yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. His most important theological work is called The Nature and Destiny of Man. That's a two-volume work. He was uh, a great thinker, but he was, he was accessible to people. He taught at the famous Union Theological Seminary in New York City for many, many decades. So, His point is that the preservation of democracy requires, requires that we reject both of these views. The optimistic view, the sentimental view, the naive, the naive view, and the cynical view of the children of darkness. He, he's looking for a third view, and that's the third view that comes from uh, his understanding of Christianity, especially of Augustine. He's known as a neo-Augustinian. He's trying to bring back the basics of Augustine's uh, Christian theology from the fourth century. The foundation of that is that uh, of, of, of Augustine's view, uh, traditional Christian belief, is that human beings differ from all other living things through the possession of a soul which afford, affords them the power to know the difference between right and wrong and choose between those different courses of action. If you hold that assumption, that means that it's not surprising to you that sometimes people will use their soul to choose the moral and rational course of affairs, or sometimes they'll use their soul to choose the irrational and immoral course of affairs. So for Niebuhr, it makes no sense to say that human beings are either moral or rational. We're both. And if we're both, that means we're neither. And that's the third way that he's searching for. He says, if we'll accept that view of human nature, then it'll be easy, easier for us to find a way to protect democracy against forces that want to destroy it. So let's read what he says about that. This is from his preface. A Christian view, of, he's looking for a resurrection of the Christian view of human nature which is more adequate for the development of a democratic society than either the optimism with which democracy has become historically associated or the moral cynicism which inclines human communities to tyrannical political struggles. Any questions? So the danger posed by moral cynics to democracy is clear enough. Their manipulative skills, and they're quite skillful at it, convince voters that civility in government uh, weakens it to the point that uh, it can no longer provide the powerful leadership necessary to protect democracy from the pressures of national and international politics. So that's, a, that's clear enough. Moral cynics are, are going to destroy allowing the people to rule in favor of their rule, their tyrannical rule. But ironically, Niebuhr is more worried about moral sentimentality because, in his view, it poses an even greater threat to democracy. Again, because of its, its naive naivete. The naivete, the naivete that uh, selfishness can easily be brought under the control of moral values. What happens, he says, is that that naivete robs us of our defenses against evil. It causes us, it causes us to let our guard down. And in doing so, it makes it, easy, it, makes it easier for evil to uh, prevail. 
Okay. So he's saying that, let me see if I understood you right. So the moral cynics are not as big of a problem because they're just going to re reject morality well, they're altogether. Well, they're, they're a big problem, but you can see them coming. But the, the, but the optimists or the sentimentalists yes. are more dangerous because they can be controlled by religion? Because, not by religion, by the cynics. Okay. It's like wolves and sheep. That's exactly the point. So their, their naivety about makes us, their beliefs it, it, and morals it makes, make it, them... It makes it... It makes it... it here, yeah, a guy... We have a community patrol in our neighborhood, which I've been doing for 40 years. Nothing ever happens, but mainly because <laughs> there are people riding around with a big sign, we're watching you. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, So, he's a very religious man, and um, he has a lot of sickness in his family, so he's always busy ferrying people in his family back from hospitals. One day he comes back from the hospital and he's helping his, I think his, one of his daughters out of their van to put her in a wheelchair. And all of a sudden a guy appears who's not from the neighborhood and he's wheeling a uh, lawnmower and says, could I mow your lawn? So he didn't even need his lawn mower. He wrote us all of this message to be on the lookout for this this turned out to be a gang of guys out to do no good. So um, it is okay. He gives him thirty dollars. Within a week they they watched his he went out for another occasion to take his family to the hospital. They broke into his house and robbed him of everything he owned. I mean, they just saw him coming. He was just such a nice, kind guy. Too he trusting. Well, well, of course, I mean, that's the point. He would have probably given them whatever they asked for. But they took advantage of him. And that's why the neighbor, they're more dangerous. It's not that the children of darkness aren't dangerous. Of course they are. But it's obvious who they are. The danger they pose is obvious. You may not be able to um, defeat them, but at least you put up a fight. These people don't put up a fight. So does this apply to like leaders or just people in general, or is just our like culture? He says, culture. Okay. our culture is dominated by that attitude. Everything will somehow turn out to be all right. What does it say? Are you a fan of fairy tales? Yeah. Well, what is always the last line of every fairy tale? Always. It's always the last line. I'll, I'll set it up for you, right? So, um, Grandma tells Red Riding Hood, don't have anything to do with the wolf. You remember? remember Happily ever after. And they all lived happily ever. See that? That's always the last line. And that's how the sentimentalists think. That everything will turn out fine. You can throw all the garbage you want into lakes and rivers and oceans, including millions of gallons of gasoline, but somehow it will all work out. You can allow um, manipulators on Wall Street to uh, do whatever they want to the banks and the economy, somehow it will all balance out. And of course that's just a lie. That's the sentimentality that he's talking about. So with that kind of point of view, You're opening yourself up to a lot of trouble, just like this poor guy, this poor, the kind and decent man. There's nothing wrong with being kind and decent, but you have to always 
beware that there are people looking to take advantage of you. This is, he took, a, they, these thugs took advantage of one man and his family. We're talking about thugs who want to take advantage of a whole country, maybe perhaps even the world. So people shouldn't be too kind-hearted, but no. not too you can be kind hearted, you, I guess. You can't be blind to evil in the world. That doesn't mean you can't be kind hearted, you just have to be aware. Remember the example I used to I used to use? It's Friday afternoon and you're coming home from work and you've just been paid. Just to make my example better, I'll say you paid in cash. And your cash is in your pocketbook and you're working on the 15th floor. So you get into the elevator and everyone wants to get home, so it stops at every floor. And the elevator is getting more and more crowded. It doesn't mean that you can't smile and say to people, have a nice weekend and hope to see you on Monday, take care of yourself. It just means that you have to take your pocketbook and hold it close to your side for fear that somebody will reach into it, some skillful pickpocket, into it and steal 